Uh, today, uh, we're, we're continuing on our power series, and uh, the first week we started talking about pow- is there power in the name of Jesus, and we worked through that. Then when last, or a couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, the reality of there's power in our love, the love that we as a church have for one another. Uh, th- this week, we want to talk about this idea of th- there being power in worship. A- and to talk about there being power in the worship, we probably need to answer some of the questions of what is worship and why should we worship. And just even how should we worship? And so as we work our way through those questions, I I do want to let you know that I I really believe to experience worship, to experience the power in worship, you and I need to be living out our faith authentically and as real as it can be at a very raw level, living out our faith. And in that, we will be able to experience the power of worship. In a moment, we're going to turn to John chapter 4. So if you like to get ahead, that's where you want to go. Uh, In John chapter 4... Uh, we're going to pick up on an interesting story in Scripture of a conversation that does talk about worship, but there's, there was more to it than just worship. So just to give you a little background, uh, Jesus was taking the disciples, and they were heading to Galilee. Now, normally, when Jesus, being a Jew, and his disciples, being a Jew, would go to this place called Galilee, they would maneuver around uh, the country of Samaria. Now, there was tension that existed between Jews and Samaritans, and, and so one of the ways to avoid that, you just wouldn't travel through. But Jesus being Jesus sure liked to break down a lot of cultural barriers and issues, and he would instead travel right into the tension of Samaria, because that's what Jesus does, and he does it well. So Jesus arrives in Samaria, sits down at a well, and sends the disciples into the community nearby to go get supplies and some other things. And while he was at that well, he would encounter a woman, a Samaritan woman. She would come to do what she was going to do at a well and get some water. But Jesus, being Jesus, didn't pass up the opportunity. And, hey, when you're at a well, why not talk about water? So that's what he did. And Jesus would ask her for a drink. Well, this lady knows the tension that exists between Jews and Samaritans. And and so she points that out to him of going, hey, this is already awkward enough. But for you to talk to me, this this is crossing some lines. And, And it's crossing lines not just because she's a Samaritan and he's a Jew, but it's also because she's a woman. But Jesus breaks down those type of barriers and, and deals with those kind of issues that existed in the world at that time, culturally, and he would address her as a person. Now, their conversation, their conversation would go a, a whole lot of different ways with a lot of different points, but ultimately, even when she would often try to change the subject matter, Jesus would sort of redesign the conversation with grace and love and truth And constantly bring her back to where the conversation needed to go. Now some of the tension that exists between Jews and Samaritans is what we're going to pick up on in this conversation. They had disagreements on where you should worship. They had some disagreements and it was rooted in some history. There was some, to make a long story short, there were some kingdoms conquered. Uh, There was, the Jews were given back the ability to go into Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And they didn't invite the Samaritans to help them do that. And there was some just... A lot of tension in the air. And so she begins to ask these questions of, well, okay, let's talk about this worship thing. And you Jews say we have to worship in Jerusalem in the temple. Why can't we worship on on this mountain where we Samaritans do? And we're going to see Jesus' response in John chapter 4. Look at verse 23 and 24. A time is coming and has now come. This is Jesus' response to her. When true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in the truth. So she's asking the question of where. Jesus gives her a different kind of answer, because that's sort of the way Jesus works quite a bit with questions. You know, we want to take something like worship, and we want to domesticate it. And we want to cram it into a certain hour of time period in our week, and that's it. But Jesus is going, no, if, if you operate with that mindset, you're missing what really matters. And in fact, Jesus identifies what really matters. What really matters is what or who we worship and how we worship. Now, the what or who is God. The how, he uses the language to say, well, you need to worship in, in spirit and in truth. That that's the kind of worshiper that, that God is looking for. And to worship in spirit, I mean, it's acknowledged in the scripture, Jesus said that, well, God is spirit. And so there's a connection within that. You as a follower of Jesus are filled with the Holy Spirit. And being filled with the Holy Spirit means you and I need to submit 
to the Spirit's authority and influence in our lives, in the way we live, in, in our will, in the way we make choices, in our mindset. I mean, we want the Spirit to lead and guide us, to worship in spirit and worship in truth. If we're going to worship in truth, then you and I need to conform to the truth of God's Word. We need to, to get into the Scriptures and, and say, okay, man, what the Scripture says, I'm going to let invade how I live my life. And in this are true worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. Now, God's never been a God who sort of lays something out and then backs away and leaves us alone. He, well, he sent a helper called the Holy Spirit. So this idea of worshiping in spirit and in truth, it is because God is at work helping you do that. He's transforming you to become a worshiper who worships in spirit and in truth. And in, within that transformation is an invitation to not, just, well, to not just have to worship, but to truly get to worship. Uh, today, as we talk about the power of worship and really sort of break it down, uh, I, I've asked some good friends to come and, and help me with this, and, and the wisdom they bring to the table is good. We, we just walked through it in first service, and I think you're going to uh, eat it up and enjoy it as well. But would you welcome Chris and Mark uh, up here to the platform? Now, I, I know most of you probably recognize Chris. Uh, we, get the, we get the privilege to hang out with him usually every weekend as he leads us in worship. And uh, this is Mark. I'm going to have Mark introduce himself in just a second. But what I want you to know about these two is they're not just about music. Uh, I get the chance to hang out with these guys and have conversations and know their hearts. And it's two guys who are passionately pursuing Jesus. And we have conversations and questions of, okay, what does that really look like? How do we grow in our faith? So these aren't just two guys who know a lot about music and, and this idea of worship. But they're guys who are passionately just following Jesus each and every day and growing in their faith. Uh, Chris does an awesome job of leading us and, and on understanding that it's not only leading us, but leading the worship arts team in, in pursuing authentic worship. But Mark, you may or may not know, he does more than play the bass. And so I've asked Mark to just give you a little bit uh, of just how his story has intersected with the BNC story. So I moved to Valpo probably about almost 10 years ago now, which is absolutely crazy to me. And I started attending BNC right away when I moved here. Um, I started volunteering in the worship arts department probably from day one. And after a while, they decided to start paying me for a lot of the things that I was doing for free, which I don't understand, but I appreciate. <laughs> so after some time with that, after working in that, I got some other roles added here at the church and um, decided to really be serious about my call into ministry. Uh, started studying at Olivet, getting a uh, master's in pastoral leadership, which these guys are also doing that program. We're about one semester away now, which is awesome. And in that time, uh, got my local minister's license. So here I am today, talk about worship. So when we get the degrees, do people have to call us master? I sure hope so. Okay. <laughs> hey, as I'll, we I'll let you tell my wife that. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> as we start to talk about this idea of worship, and what does that look like to worship God in spirit and truth? And so that answers some of our, our how. But we want to break down and have a true understanding of this idea of worship. And the, the word itself can get used in so many different ways. Uh, like so many different words that we encounter just in everyday life. If I, if I throw out the word bank, uh, you go, some of you think of the bank, you're going to the bank to get money. Others of you, if you can think, it's also what we call the side of a river, the river bank. All right, uh, season. Some of you automatically, your brain went to weather, and you're thinking about the weather or the changing season. Some of you, though, let's be honest, season is also the flavor that you add to food. Uh, it's how you give it that extra flavor, give it that extra spice. I also think of words, if you were here with us a couple weeks ago working through the Power Series, raisin cookies. Thank you, all four of you that were here. Raisin cookies. Delicate bakery delight filled with uh, dried up fruit. Or methodic and malicious bait and switch tactic used by too many bakers. <laughs> That's the more accurate. The word worship 
When we come in this room, some of you, when you think worship, you use it as a verb, maybe you use it as a noun. When you walked into this room, you said, I'm going to worship. Some of you think of worship just when we're singing psalms. There's, there's, there's so many different ways that we use that word. Um, but Mark, why don't you fill us in on when we go to the scriptures, when we go to the, the, the languages that are used in scriptures, how does it define this idea, this word, worship? All right, so first off, does anybody speak Greek? Then in that case, I'm going to pronounce this 100% correct just for everybody. <laughs> the word found most often in the New Testament that um, they use for the word worship is proskuneho, and there's about 60 instances of that word in the New Testament. And it comes from two separate words. The first word, pros, meaning to prostrate oneself. I said it right. That's good. I've been practicing <laughs> that word all week. Some of you can, yeah. Ask mom later. Yep. Keep going. <laughs> then the word kaneho, which means to kiss. So with the concept of prostrating oneself, um, we're not only showing submission and reverence, but we're also putting ourselves in a position of vulnerability. And then the kiss part, it's a sign of reverence, but it's also a desire to move into more of an intimate relationship. So you're seeking intimacy with this. So we have those four ideas kind of put together, and it's submission, reverence, vulnerability, and intimacy when we think about worship. And so when you think of those four words, not only do they connect to worship, but they probably connect with your thought of, okay, this is how I live out my faith. This is what it looks like to follow Jesus. So Chris, why don't you take us once again into the scriptures to take an honest look at how can we help define those four words through how scripture design, designs and Paul states this idea of worship. I said a lot of words. That was a lot of words. Um, there are a lot of scriptures throughout the Bible that I think deal with worship, and there are some I think that are more familiar than others. One of those is probably Romans 12, 1 and 2, and I'm sure most of you know it, but um, I want to read through that and then kind of unpack that a little bit, but it will be up on the screens. If you want to follow along with me, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So if we break this down, when Paul urges us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, his premise for this is the mercies of God. Um, the Greek word for mercy, um, another one of those Greek words that I will pronounce right, is oiktirmos, which means compassion or pity. And so the first 11 chapters as we go through Romans to get up to this point um, is full of, of different examples and scenarios where God is giving this compassion or this mercy even though it is undeserved. And so this is the basis for um, what Paul is talking about when he urges us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. Um, so we also need to understand that God wants us, he wants the sacrifice of our lives, not the sacrifice of death. Um, this is different from the Old Testament sacrifices that we read about where something is placed on the altar um, to die as a sacrifice for something. Um, but, um, Paul, um, the spirit, for, for Paul, spirituality is not an emotional high. It's not um, something that quickly fades, but rather it is presenting our whole selves um, to God. See, because um, God wants the sacrifice of our life, not our death, okay? Um, since followers of Jesus, we've already died to self. Okay, so the, the sacrifice that he is desiring from us is that life that we live in him. Um, and this makes sense because God first sacrificed his son um, to, to die on the cross for, for each one of us. This is a spiritual act because this is something that we do willingly. It is not, as Pastor Keith talked about before, it's not something that we have to do, but it's something that we get to do. So the question then becomes, how do we get there? And Paul says, um, or he warns against conforming to the patterns of this world. So what does that mean? Well, to conform is to match an attitude, belief, or behavior to a group norm. And if we're not careful, then we can allow the culture around us to begin to determine um, our thoughts and our actions um, as we go through life. I and mean, I think we can agree that there's plenty of things vying for our attention that, that um, want to shape our mindset and, and how we view things. And if we're being honest, really, it's, it's kind of easier a lot of times just to conform to what the culture around us is telling us. Um, because that's the, that's the, the popular decision, that's, that's the majority 
Um, everybody's going that direction. But that's not what we're talking about here. It's not what Paul is talking about when he talks about this idea of living sacrifice. So how do we combat those things that are vying for our conformity in our lives? And the scripture, again, goes back to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this word transform goes much deeper than conformity. When you're transformed, there's a change um, in your fundamental nature and your character falls in line with that transformation. Let me read that again. When you are transformed, there's a change in your fundamental nature and your character falls in line with that transformation. So let me give you an example. A few years ago, um, I was on staff at a church um, up in Michigan. And one Sunday, I think maybe it was Father's Day, we did a, a car show as, as part, of the, part of the morning. And we had invited the Christian Motorcycle Association to come and be a part of that. So all the bikes were out there and guys in their, you know, their jackets and their, their head gear and their glass goggles, all this kind of stuff. And we thought we would give the president of the CMA an opportunity to speak uh, just briefly in our service. And so as he's up there, he's giving his best sales pitch for everyone in the room to be a part of the Christian Motorcycle Association. But he said something to this degree. He said, you don't have to own a motorcycle to be a part of the CMA. He goes, in fact, you can drive the family minivan to our meetings, but if you walk into the meeting and you look the part, no one's going to know the difference. And so essentially what he was inviting me to was to be a part of his lifestyle without really changing who I was. I kind of play golf the same way. I can dress the part. I can have the, the best clubs and the, the nicest bag and the sweetest pair of plaid pants you have ever seen. But if I don't take the time to prepare and develop my golf game, when I get out there and I take that first swing, everybody around me knows that I'm a fake. And I think sometimes that's the way it works in our spiritual lives as well. We come in on, on Sunday and we put on this mask with this face and everything's great. And by the time lunch is done, we're right back into conforming to the patterns of the world because that's what's comfortable. And right before the band came out first service this morning, Mark said something Back in the green room, because if you haven't noticed, a lot of us are doing things that are kind of out of our comfort zone today. <laughs> and um, he said, God doesn't call us to comfort. God calls us to be obedient. And I think that that plays into this idea of being a living sacrifice. So how many of you have ever heard the phrase, worship is a lifestyle? Any, anybody heard that? Okay. Um, that seemed to kind of be the big buzz phrase for a while when people were trying to describe what worship is, it was kind of like that churchy answer, um, you know, that Sunday school answer that you give. Um, I've used it a lot myself, um, but the problem was I started to use it so often that it lost meaning. Um, I didn't have to think about it. it didn't, I didn't have to consider how it played or factored into what was going on. Um, I just said it because that was just the thing to say. And just like anything else, the more you say something and the more you do something, the less you have to think about it and it becomes routine. And that is what this phrase became for me. So as I started to wrestle with this idea of being a living sacrifice, I started to think of it more as a mindset as opposed to a lifestyle or a frame of mind. Because the truth is that we can all live a certain lifestyle and we can fool the people around us, even some of those people who are closest to us, but even that only lasts for, for a certain amount of time. But if our mindset is transformed, then our lifestyle becomes unmistakable. In other words, if we are living out our lives for Jesus, like Keith talked about earlier, then that's going to begin to transform our lifestyle. And everything that we do is going to um, show others around us the love um, and the truth of Jesus. Paul says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And when something is renewed, um, it's restored, it's made fresh, um, it's made new. And so we'll get into this more in just a little bit. But this renewing of the mind um, will lead to what Paul calls for us, this true and proper worship. So let's, um, let's put some skin on it. Let's put some skin on what that looks like to have that worship type mindset that is in alignment with scripture. And, and Mark, why don't you take us down one of those roads of helping identify that. First of all, Chris is right on. You could probably just say everything again. It would be good. But when no. I... <laughs> no? No passes? Denied. Cool. 
I, when I think about renewing our mind, I always go back to Matthew 25, where Jesus presents us with a different idea of how we're to, to live, a different context than the disciples were really thinking of. Just for context, uh, Matthew 25 comes in the midst of a lot of parables to that point. One of the most recent ones was about 10 virgins that Keith promised to tell me about when I'm older, which is awesome. Can't wait. But this, uh, this passage comes right before we start to learn about the plot to arrest and eventually execute Jesus. So coming in on the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 31, let's read. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and put, and, excuse me, on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared, from, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So let's uh, pause there real quick. When Jesus is talking about the kingdom there, he's not talking about heaven later. That's part of it. But he's talking about his kingdom here on earth. And since we live here on earth, let's keep that kind of focus and mindset as we go through these verses. And spoiler, side note, the king he's talking about is actually himself. So when I say king, just think Jesus. So let's, uh, let's read verse 31 again, just get us back into it. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was, I was in prison, and you came to me. Let's uh, take a quick pause again real quick before we finish up these verses. Notice Jesus said he was hungry and they gave him food. He was thirsty and they gave him water. There's no qualifications in there. Jesus didn't look at him and say, hey, listen, you guys got 25% more food than you need and I'm hungry, so could you give me a little bit? It wasn't like that. There's two qualifications. You have food, Jesus needs it, you fed him. So let's kind of keep that mindset as we're continuing through this verse. So 37. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when do we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when do we see you sick and, or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did for one of the least of these, my brothers, you did for me. You see, we've probably heard that verse a million times in different contexts. But when we're talking in the context of worship as a mindset, when we're talking about our lives being a living sacrifice, we're talking about so much more than just a music time on Sunday mornings. We're talking about seeing every human being in this world the way that Jesus is describing them. This means moving ourselves into the thought process of we get to do these things unto Jesus. We get to do these things for Jesus. Not just we have to do these things because the Bible says so for people that we may or may not like. It's super important to understand that the concept of renewing our minds is not something that we can accomplish on our own. Keith hit on this. Chris hit on this, too. It takes the redeeming work of Jesus in our lives. It takes the presence of the Holy Spirit enveloping us. And it takes this community of believers doing it together. We can't do it on our own. All of this begins with putting our faith in Jesus Christ. And since we're talking about faith now, I got a great quote from Dallas Willard that kind of as I was thinking through all this, it really shook me, and it took me a few times to get it. So, Dallas Willard said, Faith today is treated as something that only should make us different, not that actually does or can make us different. In reality, we vainly struggle against the evils of this world, waiting to die and go to heaven. Somehow we've gotten the idea that the essence of faith is entirely a mental and inward thing. You see... Worship is faith in action. We can look back in the verses in Matthew 25, and we can see all of these things that Jesus said, and they're good things to do. But doing those things without the renewing of our mind, we're just doing good things. We're not worshiping. You can do good things and it not be worship. I'm not saying that God can't work in those things. I'm not saying that God doesn't work in those things. But I'm saying without the right mindset, it's not worship. Let me give you guys an example. Um, this example hits home really well for me. So if you're offended by it, just remember my name is Mike Denny. 
So we can all agree that reading our Bible is a good thing, right? But we can go and we can read our Bible until we lose our vision. If the only reason we're doing it is to win an argument on eternal security or something like that, we're not worshiping. But if we're looking at our Bible, we're digging into the word, wanting to grow in intimacy and reverence for our God, and wanting to grow in intimacy with his creation, then that right there is worship. You see, as we read through the Bible, we constantly see how much God loves us. We see the Israelites screwing up over and over again, yet God continually comes back, and he sent his son to redeem them. He sent his son to redeem us. So we come to this verse where Jesus tells us we have to live compassionately. Yeah, we need to do it because Jesus said so. But the reality is when we worship, we realize that we get to do it because we love him and we want to worship him. So when we begin to see others not just like Jesus sees them, but when we see them as Jesus themselves, then we ourselves can be Jesus to the world. So we have to ask ourselves the questions. Is it we have to pray or we get to speak to our creator who loves us perfectly, who created us? Is it we have to go to church on Sunday or is it we get to come together as a community of believers, as brothers and sisters and worship that God? Is it we have to serve others or is it that we get to serve Jesus and live compassionate lives that pour into our communities? So let me ask everybody in here a question what does your worship look like outside of this room because we've for so long it's so easy for us to define that idea of worship simply by being in this room but these guys have beautifully stated that it goes so far beyond that so when it comes to your own life and how you're walking out your faith how are you worshiping God outside of this space are you worshiping through him through your compassion? Are you worshiping him as you, well, worship in the spirit and in the truth? And then when you're seeking that truth, seeking it for intimacy, not just to win an argument. Are you worshiping him in spirit where you are submitting to him in your life? Are you offering your body as a living sacrifice? Are you worshiping God outside of these four walls? That's the foundation for when it comes to worship in this place. It's what we do with the biblical understanding of worship that will impact, therefore, then when we gather together, how that plays out. And so we want to let that foundation be what it be in our lives, wrestle with that a little bit, but let's talk about, okay, what about when we do come into this place? What does worship look like in here? And we can go down a whole bunch of different rabbit trails on this, and we've sort of narrowed it down to just a, a couple things we want to talk about. And one of them is the, the reality and the, the struggle that can exist for some people in regards to their emotions and the idea of worship. Now, for some of you, you are over the top emotion, hands in the air like you don't, just don't care. I mean, you, you're all in that way. Some of y'all, you, you keep it all just bottled up inside and nice and tight, and you don't let anything out. Um, I'm going to have Mark talk to us a little bit about what does it look like to have that healthy, beautiful blend of our emotions in our worship. So we're going to talk about our feelings? Yes. Beautiful. So let's talk specifically about emotions and how they do and should affect worship. Let me tell you guys a little story since we're talking about vulnerability too. When I was a kid, I cried a lot. I was probably what you would consider a crybaby. And uh, this lasted pretty much all the way about to sixth grade. Just cried about everything. Teacher, look at me weird. Done. Why are you guys laughing? I just told you. But between being made fun of for it by my classmates, which middle school girls are mean. Wait a second, that was, that, that was just last week. <laughs> yeah. Last week a middle school girl thought I was you. That it's is a true, true story. That is true. <laughs> He's 10 years older than me. It's, it's, Jeez. <laughs> it's my facial hair, but go ahead. Yeah. Anyways, I thought it was my gray hair. All right. <laughs> what was the question again? I know the answer is Jesus, but you got to somehow turn this ship around. 
So somewhere in sixth grade, I decided that real men don't cry. And so I just quit my emotions, got over it. And then uh, through that time, over the last 22 years, I've probably cried maybe twice. One of those was 2003 NLCS, which, thank goodness, uh, I can finally talk about without getting choked up. But on top of that, I was... I had some mentors in my life that taught me that as Christians, we can't just make decisions based off feeling. So I took those teachings and kind of crammed everything together in the pseudo messed up theology where I tried to empty all my worship of emotion. Um, just try to make it just purely a cerebral thing. I'm here today to tell you that that was stupid and I'm an idiot. If my brother was here, he'd be saying amen. But... I want to tell you there's nothing wrong with emotion. God created them for a reason. God put them in our lives for a reason. To pretend like emotions aren't a factor would be silly. So we talked about the different aspects of the word worship in Greek, and two of those are vulnerability and intimacy. I don't know how you can use those words and then not evoke an emotional response. But here's the important thing. We don't come to Sunday morning just to get some emotional high. If that was the case, we could sit here and we could watch Remember the Titans every single week. That movie has all the feelings. That's, that's Sean's favorite movie, and he's crying somewhere right now. <laughs> it's all. So God, God created us to experience beauty, and the fact is it's all around us, and we can see glimpses of it, and in those glimpses we can see God himself. We can see his own beauty, his love for us, and his desire for intimacy with us, and music is that exact same way. I can still remember the first time, the first song that I heard when I was slow dancing for the first time with a girl. I don't remember the girl's name, but I remember the song. And we looked, we looked up the lyrics to that song. Don't ask me. It's naughty. It ain't right. I don't know why anybody would play that at a sixth grade dance. To make a boy like you cry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Am I going to have to lower your seat again? Oh. So the way the music and lyrics work together is amazing because God created it to be that way. You put the right melody with the right harmony and the perfect rhythm, and it's going to express more than just word. It's going to express motion. And I think that's right. I think that's good. This music is, has the ability to convey our love and our adoration for God in a way that transcends the words we're singing and it gives us the opportunity to worship together with a unified voice. You realize there's people all across the world that, possibly sing the exact same songs that we sang today. It brings the church together. And those are good things, and that's probably going to evoke motion, emotion, and hopefully motion, get your dance moves on. But that emotion needs to be in its proper place. So with that, we need to come into our Sunday mornings prepared for that. And Chris, why don't you talk us through thoughts on what it is to prepare to come together to worship. When we stop and think about it, we, we really prepare for a lot of different things, and we, we spend a lot of time in those preparations. Let me give you a couple examples. Um, job interviews, if, you know, if you've had a job interview, hopefully you prepared before you went into that job interview. Um, some things, maybe they're a little bit less mundane, but it's still pre preparation, whether we realize it or not. Um, a trip to the grocery store. Uh, we prepare, we make a list, we make sure that we have got everything that we need, then we get everything that we want to get. Um, some of you may or may not want to admit that you perhaps prepared for Y2K and spent a lot of time doing that. Um, students, if you're a student in the room, hopefully you are preparing for a test that you have to take, um, you know, because you want, you want to do well. Um, back in, in 2009, my family had the opportunity to go to Orlando, um, and I'm going to condense the story because we're, we're running short on time, but um, we spent countless hours, part of that trip was, was to take a trip, take the kids to Disney, and we spent countless hours and weeks, and it turned into months, preparing for this trip so that we could get the most out of the trip. We had these grand expectations, and we wanted to make sure that we did everything we could to set ourselves up to have the experience that we were hoping for, and so we took the time to prepare for these things. So um, there's a lot of time that we spend preparing for things throughout our lives, but the question I want us to think about this morning, and don't, don't jump off the cliff too quick, but the question I want to throw out is, why do we spend so little time preparing ourselves for worship? 
why do we come into worship with such low expectations of what God can do in us and through us, yet we spend so much time preparing for everything else in our lives, but the time we spend to prepare for worship is very minimal. We expect way, way too little. And these are, these are things I've had to wrestle with in, in my own life. Um, but as I've done so, I think God is continuing to shape in me. It's, he's not done yet, but he is continuing to shape in me a true passion and desire to worship him. And I think that he has done this as I have gone through the process of preparing myself for worship. See, I've learned in everything that we do, every single thing that we do, no matter how significant or insignificant it might be to you in the moment, Everything we do shapes who we are. Some things have greater impact than others, but at the end of the day, every single thing we do shapes us either in a good way or in a bad way. And notice I said that this is a, this is a process. This is not something that just happens at the snap of a finger. It's, it's a little more than, than spending five minutes in prayer or five minutes reading your Bible before you come to church on Sunday morning. And that's a good thing, but that's just a small part of the bigger process of preparing ourselves to be that living sacrifice as we come into worship. So I go back to Romans 12 when it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When we allow God to renew our minds through studying his word, through prayer, through times of private and corporate worship, men's groups, women's groups, life groups, whatever, whatever your vice is, okay, um, our mindset begins to, to turn into a mindset that is more focused on this idea of worship. It can't be just going through the motions. Uh, like I think Mark talked about earlier, it can't just be, oh, I can't, I can't do anything Tuesday because I have to go to Bible study. It's, that's, that's routine, and that's, that's that, like we talked about, we're, just, we're doing it because it's routine. Um, but we're not doing it for the right reasons. It's got to be more than that. Because God is inviting us into a relationship with him where he can mold us and he can shape us into living our lives in such a way that is honoring and pleasing to him. Okay? It's that act of being a living sacrifice. When we live in this way, we can see evidence of God's presence in and around us in almost everything that we do. And when we're living in the presence of God each and every day, then that gives us great cause in cel for, re for celebration and for a reason to come in and to worship. So when we gather on Sunday mornings for worship, we're not here simply to re-energize for the week that's before us, um, but also, and perhaps maybe more importantly, to celebrate what God has done in our midst already. Just think about this for a second. What would it look like if we came in on a Sunday morning all together with the same collective expectation of celebrating a faithful God rather than coming in just to see what God is going to give us before we leave? Because here's the deal. Even if we come in without expecting anything, we can't leave empty-handed. That's not the way God works. Because as we pour ourselves out in worship, thanking him for what he's done, thanking him and praising him for his faithfulness, he then in turn will pour his presence back into our lives and that is what sustains us as we move forward. It's through this act of worship that we experience that emotion that Mark talked about, not just the, 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 high, the emotional high that quickly fades, but rather the emotions of reverence and awe as we come into the presence of a God who is so faithful and who is so powerful in our lives. This is when we fall prostrate, like what Mark was talking about before, before a God who is inviting us into that intimate relationship with him. And so here's what I hope that we understand this morning before we leave. Our mindset impacts our ability to see God at work in our lives. Okay, think about that for just a second. Our mindset impacts our ability to see God at work in our lives. And when our minds are fixed on Christ and he is continuously renewing our minds to his likeness, then God's evidence is all around us. And when we begin to see God in everything that we do, then we become filled with this desire to want to worship, to get to worship. It's no longer a have to kind of thing. It's because of these mercies and this compassion that we talked about that he gives so graciously to each of us, that's the foundation for why we get to worship Christ.